Obtaining one of the uh, robotic arm assisted devices here at Tufts was something that required the facility and vision of the senior leadership here and we actually kind of set the standard nationally for how it can be done to adopt a technology into a tertiary academic center uh, in a way that had, is kind of unprecedented in setting the stage and I'm very grateful for that and you'll see th through this next 20 minutes here my excitement for the technology and hopefully I'll be able to explain it to you and get you to understand it and be excited about it. So um, there's kind of two parts here to understanding the technology. You need to understand arthritis and so I have a little bit of an arthritis 101 here. Understanding what it is to have a knee problem or a hip problem. So I want to take a couple minutes to talk about arthritis and how do we get from an arthritic knee to a knee replacement knee because understanding that is critical to understanding how the robot works and how it benefits us. So a knee is a complex joint. Uh, all joints in the body have cartilage in them and the knee is not just a door hinge like a lot of people think. It moves in different directions, it can translate, shift, move and there's cartilage on the end of the bone that coats the end of the bone. So when people get arthritis of their knee it's when the cartilage on the ends of the bone get damaged and leads to functional problems. So this is an x-ray that looks pretty good. You can see when we look at an x-ray we can only see the bones but you can see there's some pretty good space here in between the bones. So if someone comes in and says your x-rays look pretty good that's what they're thinking in their mind. There's space and good cartilage here. Here's one not so good. So when you look at it back to back you can see but see there's no space anymore on the inside there. But this is a knee that has quite a bit of arthritis. There's bone on bone inside of the knee there and that leads to inflammation, pain and discomforts and quality of life compromises. And so the knee arthritis can affect the knee in different ways. So you may have seen people who are bow leg and people who are knock kneed. So depending on which way your leg is crooked is determined by where the arthritis is in the knee. And so one of the crucial things when we go to try to fix these is people want to get a straight leg or a straight hip when they're, when they're fixed. And so traditionally the way we do this is done by hand and by eye. It's my practice and my training and so it's crucially important. Now sometimes we get folks like this where that knee is just totally destroyed. There's really nothing left there. It's grinding the bone away and that's a patient that can really barely walk. So how do we get from here to here? So a knee replacement is, does not mean that we chop the leg like this and like that and take it all out and put it all back. It's, a, a, I would say six out of ten patients assume that and are relieved when I tell them we're not chopping your leg off and putting it back. And so I wish it was called a knee resurfacing because that's much more accurate for how a knee replacement works. And it has a bunch of parts to it. But there's basically a cap that wraps around the end of the bone that's made out of metal. There's a cap that sits on top of the tibia bone that's made out of metal. And then there are plastic cushions that go in between and there's a little cushion that goes under the kneecap. So when I put a knee replacement on, I still have to skim off the end of the bone in a somewhat complex way that I have to get the rotation right, I have to get the flexion right, I have to get the alignment right, I have to get the size right, and I have to do that with what you would consider our shockingly archaic tools. We have calipers, we have clamps, we have little drop bars, and we have to pin them onto the bone to get it right. So well, I've had the fortune of doing about 2,500 knee replacements and 1,500 hip replacements over the last 10 years, and I would like to think I'm pretty good at doing this, but there's still an intrinsic variation that I, no matter how good a job I do, the literature suggests I'm within three degrees of where I think I am. and I like to think I'm better than that. So once it's all done, this is kind of what you end up with so the parts can kind of fit on the ends of the bone. And we try to make things perpendicular as best we can. Then the metal part fits there and then I skim off the end of the kneecap. You don't lose your kneecap when you get a knee replacement. There's a plastic part that goes inside. And so once we're all done, that's what it looks like. So and that's how it functions. So the knee replacement works because it puts a new surface on the end of the bone that fools your body into thinking all is well. And then the inflammation goes away and the knee feels better. But the key is fooling your body to thinking that all is well. And if things aren't lined up right or sized right or tensioned right, then your body doesn't think all is well and that's when you can get knee replacements that don't feel good. There's actually some statistic that shows that of a Medicare population that was sampled, 90 to 95 percent of the patients met good to excellent result criteria for knee replacement when you objectively measured how they're doing. But the same exact group, about 75 percent of the patients, reported that they were having a good to excellent outcome. So there's this big gap in what we call the forgotten joint. And so the evolution of technology is to try to improve our ability to do better at this. So this is me doing the job. That's a bad knee and that's what I did to it. So it looks like the pictures. That's good. I wish they all looked as perfect as that and most of them do. 
But, um, but that's what we want a knee replacement to look like. And here's me taking care of the really complicated one. See, nice straight leg. Had to put a screw in that one to get it straight. Um, but that is a fancy case, which is actually par for the course at Tufts here. All right, deep breath. Everybody got the knee? You ready? OK, let's do the hip real quick. Um, so the hip is the same concept. It's not mechanically as complicated. It's a ball and a socket. Still the same idea of cartilage around the bone. See the nice little shadow here in between? That hip doesn't look terrible. It doesn't look perfect. There's a little bone spur there, but this is what arthritis looks like. See, it's hard to tell where the ball stops and the socket starts. So that's a very bad, worn out hip. And so that person ultimately had enough pain that they decided they wanted to have a hip replacement. And then sometimes, like the other one, it can get very severe where there's very, the leg is short, the spine is worn out, the pelvis is crooked. And these patients can be very, very uh, compromised in terms of their function and quality of life. With the hip, unfortunately for your hip, we take the ball out. It's not a skim thing. It's a remove thing. So once we get access to the hip, the ball comes out that's all worn out. And then I have these little cheese graters that spin that come in one millimeter increments. And I use them to scoop out the bone until, in my eye and my judgment, and with a decent amount of perseveration, I decide that we've got the right size for your socket. And then there's a, a socket that has a rough surface on it that squeezes in there and gets knocked in place. And I try to match the pelvis. And on the stem side, we have these little rafts that go down. And then the real implant slides down in from the top. So that has made us a lot less invasive than it used to be. But, um, and then ultimately, you match everything together. So you have a new ball, a new socket, and a plastic cushion in between the sandwich. But it's the same concept as the knee replacement, where you have to get the parts lined up right. You have to get them to fit the bone. And there is an amazing variation in the community. And a lot of what we do at Tufts here is fix other problems that have come in because of technical mistakes. And so we like to see a hip like this all worn out, and it ends up like that. New ball and socket. That one was done by hand, by me, and it's lined up pretty good. So in summary, knee replacements and hip replacements have been around for a while. They've been evolving over the last 30 years or more now, and the durability and function of knee replacements has improved considerably. But we've kind of reached a plateau in terms of our ability to put them in in a way that is going to function predictably and reliably better for everybody. And so that's where this comes in. So there's the, there was a movement about almost nine, almost 10 years ago now, by some smart people who had the idea to use the arm technology that's often used in automotive manufacturing, where they can use an arm device that can reproducibly move and do things in a certain way, but then marry that to biology and link it to, so that we can actually use this technology to improve our ability to do all that stuff I just talked to you about. And so, so the concept here is, what is the robot-assisted surgery? How, why do we have it? What, is it? what is my interest in it? And then ultimately, how does it work? So what is it? Normally, I make a jab at another robot at this point. But I, I've been instructed carefully since someone who I might be married to actually does <laughs> da Vinci surgeries and happens to be here. So I'm not going to make any big disparaging concept, comments about the da Vinci robot today, which I usually make a really off-colored one. But, but the point of this is the da Vinci robot is this very large thing. It's its own procedure. The surgeon sits away from the patient using a virtual technology. And so it's a, it's a very different concept. And, and that's one of the important things to understand that the robotic arm surgery is not a new procedure. It's augmenting and enhancing our ability to do our current surgery. So here it is. This is our robotic arm. It's, uh, it was, we were the first uh, uh, hospital in the Boston metropolitan area to have one. We were the first hospital in Massachusetts in July to do a total knee replacement with the robotic arm. It's a very exciting technology. And as I said, it's about the size of a shopping cart, I say, or it takes up the space of the medical student in the OR. Um, and so, um, so, no, just kidding, actually. Actually, the residents have been getting to do more with this than ever because the robotic arm in acts the plan, as you'll see, in a very precise and protected way. And so I can actually let them steer the ship a little more than I ever could because, in truth, they're actually doing less than they ever did because they can't screw up. So you hold the thing in your hand. So you can see there is an attachment on the top of the arm there. Then that one's for the hip, where the actual implant is attached to the end there. 
And the robotic arm knows where it is in space, as we talked about, but I still have to hold it and guide it and tell it where to go. And so this is the whole system of the robotic arm, where there are these infrared eyeballs that can see the little reflectors on the robotic base. And the magic is it knows where the tip of the robotic instrument is very precisely, within a millimeter and a half a degree. And then it's shown on the computer screen that I use live in the surgery to adapt. So this is kind of how the operating room sets up. And this is our team, actually. But there's Dr. Barrett's in the operating room with the robotic arm. And so it is a, a big initiative in the orthopedic joint replacement division right now. Um, but we have two physician assistants that work with our team as well. And so the robotics initiative has really been something we've really helped to uh, create momentum in the joint replacement division here uh, and excitement. And uh, it's, it's been really wonderful how everybody in multiple facets of what we do has really jumped on board in terms of the operating room team, the operating room set up, the pre-op, the post-op, the navigation before and after the surgery. There's been a lot of, it's more than just the machine here is, is the point of all of that. And so the idea here is to do a better job at what I explained to you as what, to what we do. We get a scan of the patient before the surgery and it creates a 3D model of their hip or their knee. And then before the surgery, I work with uh, one of our technicians to create the implant's position in the person before we do the surgery. So these surgeries have kind of gotten turned on their head. It used to be, I did all the work, and then we would put trials in and I would feel it. And I would say, eh, we're a little tight here, we're a little crooked there, it looks straight, and then we'd make little adjustments. Now, it's totally the opposite way. We plan the surgery virtually on the computer screen, and then during the operation, the robot knows where they are in space, and I can make all those adjustments before I do anything to the person. And then, once we're happy, the robotic arm comes in and helps me actually perform the surgery. And that's really where the magic is of the technology. Because now instead of going, eh, it looks like one degree, it says, you're in one degree of alignment. Do you want to be in zero? Make it zero and adjust it. And then it will implement that plan. So this is some of the exciting stuff about the robot. And this is what has gotten me excited. It has been part of my excitement to be here at Tufts. Um, but we are the first tertiary academic hospital in Boston. There are about only a dozen academic centers in the United States that have the robot. It is gaining penetrance, and it has had a lot of early adoption in the community. And so there are quite a few of these out there. Um, there's Wayne Muschietti, who wrote a paper about a year ago that they did one of these Markov analyses and showed that you had to do 94 cases uh, to make the robot break even. And this was before the robot could do total knee replacements. And so everybody said, there's no way I'll ever do 94 partial knee replacements. But I'm proud to say we booked our 100th knee replacement and hip replacement uh, recently. And, uh, and so within six months, we've hit our target because of the increased and broadened applicability of the technology. And the hope with this is that we'll bring more of this technology to people in Boston and around Boston and bring them into Tufts. And uh, we have our team and we have our crew that's very uh, focused on growing us and, our, and what we offer. And so uh, we certainly have seen and I continue to see a growing demand from patients coming into our organization specifically for the technology. It wouldn't be an academic center if we didn't do academic things, and I really like to teach, and, I've, and, I, and this is a tool to really help me uh, take principles and now put them into action. It, uh, I know I talk everybody's ear off in the operating room before the surgery even starts now because I can start teaching as soon as the 3D model is up there and can adjust things and see what's going to happen if we move the implant this way or that way a little bit. And that's the real power of it, which we could never do that before. And my hope is to get some studies off the ground. Some of them will be in coordination with Stryker. We just had our, one of our society meetings last weekend and I connected with them and hopefully we'll get some of that stuff off the ground. But, the robotic arm for uh, knee replacements has only been uh, FDA approved for the full knee replacement since March, and so uh, it, nationally speaking. And so we are really on the front end of this technology, and we're really excited about it and really trying to drum up excitement around us to help uh, do this. And then ultimately, this is what it's all about, is getting patients to do better and la have implants that work better and live and function longer. And uh, anecdotally, people have been doing great. Um, the robot cases, when they come back now, I just kind of go, oh, this is going to be an easy clinic visit because uh, their implants are always look the same as the templates. The surgeries go the way they're supposed to go. And we'll have complications because it's the nature of doing surgery. But in general, the robotic arm, in my experience so far, these first 50 to 100 cases is really doing an amazing job of doing what it's supposed to do. So then, of course, the exciting part. So the end of the, the, end of the robot has different attachments. So this is, this is the little reamer for hips. This is the little birth, 
thing for uh, partial knee replacements. And this was the real te technological leap forward is the little saw that does knee replacements attaches to the end. And this is what a scan looks like. And so um, uh, this is a partial knee replacement, but this is before I even touch the person. I get to move those parts around to fit it and make it look where it's supposed to go. And here, just like the pictures I showed you in the little diagrams, this is what a knee replacement looks like. And all these numbers are the resection levels, eight millimeters here, two and a half millimeters there, zero degrees of rotation here. These are all numbers I never had before. And part of our learning process with this is processing these things and making them do, a, uh, do the right job. And this is showing that the leg is in three degrees of malalignment. So all I have to do is get that 16 to become a 19 and then the leg will be straight and that's what we do live in the operating room with the robotic arm and can make adjustments so this is the summary slide here but we're really hoping to do a better job at putting these parts into patients and I think there's a real potential breakthrough here uh, in terms of improving things by patient to patient basis it's a way of doing a custom specific surgery for someone using a tried and true implant this will hopefully make people do better improve the outcomes and reach more people in the population. And I think in the future we're gonna see improvements and changes in the surgical technique. This, the robotic arm is like uh, the Tesla cars that can download upgrades into their brain and the robotic arm can do that and they're gonna come up with an upgrade in January that's actually gonna make the hip replacement surgeries less invasive than they are now because I won't need to see as much to tell it where it is and there will be continued technological improvements and this may lead to new implants and ultimately we got to study it. Mm -hmm.